working at um, Baylor in 10 Temple, Texas for internal medicine. And then I did my fellowship at UT Houston, MD Anderson. So I, I did deal with a good amount of immunocompromised patients. Currently I practice in Fort Worth, like uh, Dr. Reddy was saying. Um, and so I'm happy to help out and share some information we have about Mucor. We have not been seeing a lot of it associated with COVID here, but i um, happy to talk about it in general and immunosuppressed patients. Philip. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> good morning there in India and uh, good evening. Here. Well, good morning here. <laughs> good evening in India and good morning here, by the way. Anyway, I'm, my name is uh, Dr. Philip Antiporta. You know, I'm, I'm born and raised in uh, Manila, Philippines. And, you know, I trained in Michigan and, uh, and with infectious diseases in Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago. So um, same way, you know, I work with um, uh, Dr. Yala Manchili and, uh, you know, nice to have, uh, it's an honor for us to be here. Thank you guys. Okay, shall I just click share screen and go to the PowerPoint? Yeah, uh-huh. One second. Arika, hope you are uh, able to share it. Yeah, I don't. Hmm. I have it pulled up. I'm clicking share screen. Yes. Yes. Why it's not letting me. Is, is it, can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see, we can see. Okay. Okay. All right. So we going over Mucor. So kind of just the basics, I will just go over what is Mucor, kind of some uh, information about risk factors, diagnosis and medical therapies and precautions. So. What is mucormycosis? So a uh, disease caused by fungi of the order mucoralis. So this is made up of several other um, organisms, rhizopus, uh, mucor, rhizomucor, cunninghamella, and obsidia. The other pseudonyms you will sometimes hear is black fungus or black mold, um, fairly synonymous with mucor. There has been an increased association identified with COVID-19 uh, along with aspergillus, but more recently in India, it's been a higher rise in mucor cases, particularly in patients on steroids and those with uncontrolled diabetes. Um, these mucoralis organisms are ubiquitous in nature and they can be found pretty much everywhere, uh, many times on decaying vegetation, in the soil, when people are working in, in the fields or in construction, these are kind of rampant. So there's a lot of exposure out there for a, the everyday person. Normally you're able to clear this fairly well. However, if you do have some other immunocompromising condition at baseline or secondary immunocompromising condition from steroids or other agents, you are at higher risk for having difficulty clearing this and having more invasive disease. So inoculation mostly occurs when you are inhale these spores um, and inhale the uh, organisms and it enters into the sinuses and lungs and settles in and can cause angioinvasive disease. Um, it can also enter the body if you have any kind of skin breakdown with a burn, cut or otherwise abrasions. Um, like I mentioned, it is an angioinvasive fungus. So you do have, inf uh, you get infarction and necrosis of your tissues from invasion of this fungus into the vasculature. There are varying presentations of mucor, uh, rhino, cerebro-rhino-orbital, pulmonary, gastrointestinal, cutaneous, disseminated. Um, so it, it can present differently, so you kind of have to be on the lookout for this. More commonly, we are seeing more so the rhino, cerebral, or pulmonary, and or pulmonary. So diagnosis, um, symptoms depend on the organ involvement and stage of diagnosis at presentation. Um, so many times you have a combination of any of these symptoms. So you will have fever, facial and sinus pain, uh, sometimes, sometimes unilaterally, purulent, foul smelling, nasal discharge, um, otherwise sinusitis symptoms, facial pressure, um, sometimes unilateral facial numbness, orbital edema, periorbital edema, proptosis if it's gone a little bit further along, visual disturbances, you can have uh, altered mentation, um, headaches out of the ordinary, 
worsening shortness of breath above baseline. Um, you know, if you've had COVID and you've recovered and you have worsening shortness of breath a couple of weeks down the line, development of hemoptysis, um, any kind of uh, internal or external evidence of infarcted tissue on the nose or palate, which can look like kind of blackish discoloration. Um, insisting with diagnosis, you have you can get a CT sinus and or CT chest uh, to help aid your diagnosis if you have a high enough clinical suspicion with a combination of any of these symptoms. Um, just notably, the sometimes the uh, adjunctive tests that we use to diagnose um, fu invasive fungal infections, including the 1,3-beta D-glucan, which is also known as fungitel, and the aspergillus galactomenin, these will be negative. So, um, because the agents that cause mucor don't have these components in the cell wall, so they won't be, uh, so you shouldn't, it, it, this won't give you like a clue either way necessarily. Like, if, um, so don't use these as adjunctive testing. Um, and it, of course, uh, if you have a high enough clinical suspicion, getting um, an endoscopic examination for evaluation and tissue sampling would be very important. And um, just one thing about the CT chest. So sometimes you can see this thing called a reverse halo sign. Um, it's more commonly seen in mucor mycosis uh, over other pulmonary fungal infections. So this is basically when you have a focal rounded area of ground glass opacity that is surrounded by a crescent or a complete ring of consolidation. So a little bit different than our otherwise, like our aspergillus um, pulmonary infections that we see. You can also just see pulmonary nodules that kind of evolve, um, uh, but, this is kind of a little bit more seen in mucor over other pulmonary uh, lung infections. So diagnosis wise, you know, proven mucor is really when you have actual histopathologic, cytopathologic, or direct microscopic examination of these fungal hyphae in biopsy, or um, you're seeing this uh, significant tissue damage with a positive culture result. Sometimes your labs are able to do PCR testing on tissue samples if it's available. Not all labs, I don't think, will have that capacity. Um, but of course, it's very difficult to get a full proven diagnosis. So sometimes you have to just um, base it on corresponding symptoms. Um, correct host, if this is a patient that you have, have reason to suspect will have a compromised immune system enough to develop um, mucor uh, in, in congruent with uh, imaging and of course direct examination. It can be of course rapidly progressive without early diagnosis and treatment. The overall all-cause mortality of this is 54% prior to all of these more recent episodes coming up. So risk factors include uh, diabetes, poorly controlled or patients that are in a uh, ketoacidotic state, uh, glucocorticoid use, uh, hematologic malignancies, particularly if you have a patient that has like AML on boriconazole prophylaxis, uh, solid organ transplant patients that are immunosuppressed, iron overload patients, patients with hemochromatosis, uh, patients with, that are in treatment with deferoxamine, AIDS, uh, IV drug use patients, patients with trauma, burns, or severe malnutrition. Um, risk factors, uh, so sometimes uh, what they're hypothesizing is there's some kind of immune dysregulation caused by the uh, virus that causes COVID, SARS-CoV-2, um, and also that there may be some uh, lymphopenia with specifically a decrease in CD4 and CD8 T cells precipitated by the virus that are contributing to propagation of mucor cases in these patients. Additionally, you know, the We've been using slightly more uh, tocilizumab, which is an immunomodulatory drug when we use sometimes when patients go to high flow oxygen. Um, and so the use of this can also put you at higher risk for this. And development of mucor can occur weeks after receipt of these immunosuppressive drugs. Um, so you just have to have a good understanding of kind of the timeline of these patients and what, uh, what they've been on in the past few weeks. So moving on to medical therapy. So treatment is a combination of surgical debridement and antifungal therapy, along with limiting or eliminating uh, predisposing risk factors. So first line treatment really is IV amphotericin B, lipid formulation is preferred. Um, it's the drug of choice here. Uh, so you can start at five mg per kg IV daily. If you have very severe disease or CNS involvement, you do want to try to go a little bit higher to the higher end, which is would be 10 mg per kg. Higher than that at 12 has not really been shown to um, improve outcomes. Of course, renal toxicity would be a limiting factor here, so it does need to be monitored on a daily basis uh, along with your electrolytes. 
your duration for using IBM for Terrace and B is once you basically have, if there's no like set marker here, but once you have a favorable clinical response, you which can take several weeks, then you can switch to consolidation therapy um, if you need to. But if you uh, have patients who are otherwise unable to uh, tolerate amphotericin B, or if there is a shortage of amphotericin B, you can go ahead and switch to uh, oral step-down therapy earlier. Um, so that would be with isobuconazole. The other name is isobuconazonium sulfate, which is the prodrug. You'll sometimes hear it either way. The isobuconazole is uh, available both PO and IV. So it's um, 200 milligrams uh, every eight hours for six doses, so 48 hours. And then you do 200 daily. The isobuconazonium is 372 milligrams. The posaconazole, uh, there's a few different formulations. There's delayed release tablets, there's suspension, and there's IV. The preference is delayed release tablets if you have those available um, because the suspension will, it doesn't have as good bioavailability. And the IV, there's some limitation um, due to some of the components that make up the IV posaconazole that you want to try to avoid it in creatinine clearance less than 50. So with this one, we do 300 milligrams twice a day for two doses, uh, kind of loading them, and then you put them on 300 milligrams daily. Um, but if you do have to use the suspension, if that's all that's available, the dosage would be 200 uh, four times a day um, initially, and then you switch to twice a day. And with these azoles, the hepatotoxicity is probably going to be a little bit more of your limiting factor, whereas renal toxicity would be with your amphotericin. Um, there's not really any good data to support combination therapy sometimes if we have a very aggressive case or they are unable to be debrided for whatever reason. Sometimes we have used it, in, at least in my anecdotal experience, combination therapy with the uh, one of the azoles that are active against mucor and amphotericin, um, but it's not currently recommended to use both at the same time especially it will increase your toxicities and your patient will have difficulty tolerating it. And especially if you're in a situation where there's limitations as far as drug availability, you kind of want to try to avoid that. Um, technically, your alkinocandins, mycofungin, caspofungin, anadulofungin, they do not have in vitro activity against the agents that cause mucor. Um, there has been some data to prove that there may be some synergy, but it's not fully proven out yet. Um, so, uh, it's not really recommended for even salvage therapy um, and definitely not alone. Um, and you want to continue treatment until there is resolution of clinical signs and symptoms of infection along with uh, radiographic abnormalities. So likely you're looking at two to three weeks of IV amphotericin B if, um, uh, if they're able to tolerate that for that long followed by transition to PO consolidation therapy. Your total duration will vary kind of depending on the stage of disease at presentation, underlying risk factors, whether you can adjust those risk factors, clinical response, how much surgical debridement uh, was able to be performed. Um, so you're looking at probably three to six months uh, overall of treatment. It's a pretty long course. You can consider secondary prophylaxis afterwards in like for patients that you are unable to resolve their underlying immunosuppression. So you're like sometimes your renal transplant patients that have obviously will need to be on lifelong immunosuppression of some state. Um, you can consider a secondary prophylaxis with like posaconazole or esavuconazole. Um, in some cases, you might need to consider lifelong suppressive therapy. Um, as, as, again, in those contexts of those patients, not necessarily like your poorly controlled diabetics. Um, and there's no specific evidence to suggest um, prim primary prophylaxis would be indicated at this time, at least. So things, um, some precautions that can be taken you can obviously decrease or stop your steroids um, that will help you control your hyperglycemia. Um, but also importantly, really just use steroids very judiciously in these COVID patients and not really for prolonged courses. You want to avoid steroids in asymptomatic COVID patients or very mild cases, especially if they're not having any evidence of hypoxia. Um, and try not to use steroids prophylactically because you're just kind of set it, it can help set up these patients for these problems later down the line if they're not absolutely necessary. 
in patients that are on otherwise immunosuppressive therapy for a transplant or something like that, you want to see if you can limit some of their immunosuppressive therapy as best as you can. Um, like I mentioned before, controlling hypoglycemia. And then a lot of these patients that are requiring supplemental oxygen, um, making sure, educating them on using clean, sterile water with their humidifiers will also help kind of keep this uh, their exposures down at least. Um, again, masking when you can, like especially when you're working outside, uh, if you're having to work outside and like digging up a lot of soil and stuff, uh, trying to avoid that in your higher risk patients as well, just because you're just kind of exposing yourself a little bit more. Um, that's kind of all I got right now. So. Thank you, Arika. Philip, do you have anything to add? You're muted. Okay, there you go. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I just have a few slides just to add on the uh, pictures, you know, particularly the clinical presentation, but otherwise, you know, the rest the you know, same thoughts as I have. Um, let me share some of these slides. So we have one of the questions from uh, Dananjay. Is liposomal amphotericin is still nef nephrotoxic? Should I answer? Yes. So um, yes, you know, it is still like nef it can be potentially nephrotoxic, um, but much significantly less, you know, uh, compared to the traditional amphotericin B preparation or the amphotericin B deoxycholate. So, um, uh, being a nephrologist, I do see a few cases of amphotericin uh, renal failures, acute kidney injuries. Usually they are uh, uh, reversible. Uh, considering the benefit versus the risk ratio, a lot of times we proceed with caution. We continue to give the amphotericin, monitor the renal function. Um, it's uh, depending on the patient and depending on the CBRT, sometimes it's worthwhile treat treating because we can always do the dialysis for the time being and uh, uh, acute kidney injuries do recover. So in a lot of these multi-organ failure cases, we, we continue to proceed uh, and work with the ID closely. So Philip, you want to give your couple of your slides? Yeah. Um, Um, can you see it or? Yes, we can see it. Okay. There you go. You know, there's just a few slides, you know, that I'm sharing here. So first, um, uh, as you know, so this is rhinocerebral mucor. And um, basically, um, you know, like what Dr. Yalamanchili has mentioned, it's angio-invasive. So initially it's lodged in the sinuses, you know, part initially of obviously in the nasal turbinates. And then it depends on where it is lodged anatomically, then it will invade, invade the contiguous structures. So as you can see, this is the hard palate. You can see necrotic tissue um, initially here, particularly in the corner of the eye in the medial aspect. You can see an escar here, and uh, as well as here in the bridge here. Um, initially, it went present just like this, you know, like swelling. And uh, of course, this is the time we suspect, especially if the, if, if the patient is the right host, you know, to develop mucormycosis. And then this one is actually a very nonspecific picture or a CAT scan. Uh, so as you can see, there's opacification of the left maxillary sinus. And this nonspecific, I mean, we see this all the time. So this is just how it starts, okay? And again, if it's the right host, that's the key there, the right host, then we suspect uh, mucor. Uh, obviously, the diagnosis lies uh, more on endoscopic examination if there's, you know, I would say ischemic changes, necrotic changes, you know, in the mucosa. And of course, um, definitive diagnosis lies more on histopathology. Uh, this one, uh, same, almost the same, except that, you know, there's invasion of the pterygoid uh, muscle. And again, there's already, um, I would say, impingement on that structure there. And of course, there's an air fluid level. 
Um, again, in the lungs, you know, you can see the few nodules and uh, there, there would be a large pulmonary, um, you know, vessel infarct or a wedge infarct. Um, but otherwise we can see more diffuse pulmonary nodules. Um, and usually we see more of this very diffuse disease if they're immunocompromised, which is the usual setup for mucor. Uh, occasionally we can see it in immunocompetent patients, especially if, you know, they are, I would say, um, they're engaged in, you know, occupational activities that have a lot of burden when it comes to spores. So they get colonized or super colonized, I would say, and uh, can cause disease eventually, you know, but again, it's not that common. Uh, we see more of this disorganized or diffuse disease, again, if you're immunocom immunocompromised. Um, this one is, again, nonspecific. So meaning we can, this could be aspergillus, this could be aspergilloma, or this could be mucor. And again, it lies on microbiologic diagnosis and um, really suspicion. Um, however, uh, like Dr. Yalamachile presented earlier, you can have that reverse halo sign, um, which is kind of like uh, totally different in, in such a way that there will be more opacification in, 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 inside, and then there, there will be some, I would say, aeration outside. So hence the reverse halo sign. Now, you know, um, Dr. Reddy just kind of mentioned to me, like maybe at least mentioned some of the other fungal infections that we re that were reported among COVID. And when you do, you know, preliminary literature search, all that's gonna come up is most spurgillosis, you know, and uh, some of the experts are still, I would say, um, not really doubting, but um, because it's been, even the CDC had um, really recognize this. You know, they call it CAPA or COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis. But the criteria is still about somewhat questionable, you know, because um, we're seeing a lot of these cases diagnosed almost like incidentally because they don't have the typical signs and the typical ways on which we diagnose it. You know, as we know, traditionally we do bronchoscopy and then of course with the BAL, we send them for cultures and, and then we isolate aspergillus or the fungi, the fungi. But in this case with COVID-19, you know, of course we're very hesitant to do, uh, most, most would be hesitant to do bronchoscopy given the infectiousness. And um, usually we, we see them just with a positive BAL, uh, aspergillus galactoman and antigen, um, and sometimes with serum um, beta D glucan or galactoman and antigen. Um, but otherwise, I think we still have to wait as to what would be the usual presentations, you know, once this literature are more consolidated. You know, um, we see invasive sinusitis as well. There are some reports. Um, one, two is bloodstream infection or disseminated candidiasis. Um, obviously related probably to steroids, um, high dose and probably due to that immune dysregulation as well. There are other molds that are randomly reported, you know, like fusarium. Fusarium usually can cause, you know, disseminated infection. They manifest usually too as uh, either lung infection and bloodstream infection. So for kappa, as I've mentioned, you know, varying, I would say, uh, prevalence. So around four to 35 percent among ICU COVID-19 cases. You know, we, we've, we see a few, you know, I've seen a few cases here. And again, you know, diagnosing it's a little difficult, especially, you know, they have this radiographic findings and microbiologic, I would say, criteria. Um, but it, it cannot, you know, I would say it doesn't um, jive right away with uh, kappa in such a sense, because again, with pulmonary nodules or those pulmonary findings, we see a lot of pulmonary findings with COVID-19. So I would say it's, it's very mixed picture and we, we just randomly or incidentally find aspergillus, sometimes even in bacterial respiratory cultures. So each time we see growth of mold or aspergillus, for example, after just a few days of incubation, then it tells us that it might be, you know, a high burden type colonization or disease, you know. Pathogenesis, like what Dr. Yalamanchili mentioned, it's really related to the immune dysregulation caused by uh, the virus. 
And again, I, I just quoted it here, uh, collateral effects of host recognition pathways rec required for activation of antiviral immunity may paradoxically contribute to permissive inflammatory environment that favors fungal pathogenesis. That's kind of like their, I would say, the explanation that most experts, um, you know, offer, you know, which may also be applicable, obviously, to mucormycosis. You know, again, treatment-related risks like steroids and other immunomodulating agents like the IL-6 inhibitors, like tocilizumab. Um, there's some reports or case series that they see more aspergillosis and other fungal infection for that matter than those who receive tocilizumab. But again, we don't have, I would say, those good uh, studies or bigger studies. So basically, we, we just have to wait. And some have, um, I would say, questioned the use of antibacterials, um, which may be, I would say, causing um, selection for this fungal infection or fungal colonization. You know, the timing of the disease is also variable, you know, from three to more than 14 days from ICU admissions. Um, and um, so it can be that quick or it can be that long, you know, from my experience with a few cases I would say that I've seen, it's usually beyond two weeks. Um, you know, the, these are basically the ones that are ventilator dependent. And, and a lot of times, you know, their, in their baseline presentation or the cytokine storm is just so prolonged that we're kind of forced to give them steroids for longer than the usual 10 days recommended initially, you know, after those uh, studies on dexamethasone. So, um, you know, it's something that we just have to, I would say, um, if we can minimize at some point for as long as we're comfortable doing it, and at the same time, if we can stop it, you know, um, as soon as we can. And diagnostic methods are inconsistently reported, you know, as I've said, uh, limited by the, by the epidemic and the, just the infectiousness of the virus. Overall mortality, I think this is one across the board. And this is one I think I really believe as I've seen on those a few patients we've seen. So the overall mortality is 60 to 70% associated with kappa with increased mortality demonstrated in some, but not all study. For mucor, um, you know, um, I'm expecting it should be, you know, especially even for those who are not COVID inf infected. Uh, mucormycosis, especially when it comes to a disseminated disease, you know, mortality should, should be on the higher side. So I think that's that's all I have. Um, Th you have thank, thank you so much. So there's a lot of questions, but I'll let the other panelists to chip in. After that, we'll take the questions, if that's okay with uh, 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 we, you and uh, Harika, Philip. So Dananjay. Uh, Dr. Alexander and Dr. Butt, can you guys uh, throw in some Indian perspective what's going on there? Arun, you, you have to unmute, unmute. Yeah, good evening. Uh, um, uh, very interesting talks on the very ba basis of uh, basics on neocomycosis. Uh, can I share some uh, a few slides? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, uh, these are uh, just a little bit of um, my experience here in JIPMA. Uh, uh, we are a federally funded uh, um, tertiary care center, medical school in uh, in India. Uh, in uh, JIPMA is uh, is one of those institutes because it's federally funded. Uh, unlike in many places in the West, uh, India, most of healthcare is uh, paid. So in JIPMA, we are able to give uh, patients uh, free care. So uh, their patients don't practically pay for anything. So because of that, uh, the large number of cases uh, with mucomycosis, we, we usually see every year, large meaning uh, uh, maybe 10 to 15 a year for the last five years. Uh, the last one year, the first uh, pan in episode or part of the pandemic, that is from uh, March of uh, 2020 to February 2021, uh, we had an interesting time. Uh, the number of cases of mucomycosis uh, went up. But uh, unlike uh, in this, uh, the last three months, uh, I guess the number was not so high, especially in the larger states of India. 
So people kind of didn't notice that uh, mucormycosis numbers had gone up. So where we were actually seeing uh, 15 cases a, a year, uh, in the last uh, one year, we saw 61. That was a factor of uh, four times, uh, single center. Now what uh, we would, uh, why mucormycosis was so common was uh, because India had the largest uh, lockdown of, uh, of any kind in the whole of the world. So this lockdown made uh, primary healthcare difficult, the access to primary healthcare difficult to most people. So people who are diabetic uh, would not, uh, could not see a doctor. There was no access to diabetic medicine. There was no public transportation. So we saw a lot of people with uh, uncontrolled sugars who came with mucormycosis. Uh, and uh, we were also treating patients for COVID in our hospital. We had an exclusive block with COVID. So of the 61 uh, patients we saw, uh, we one third of it, approximately uh, exactly 20 of them were COVID positive. That means they had COVID, uh, they came with mucormycosis primarily. And when we tested them, they had uh, uh, COVID uh, also, they were incidentally found to have COVID. And the remaining were just uh, mucormycosis probably because they were not getting uh, treatment for diabetes. So last year, we never saw any patient uh, who was treated for COVID uh, and then developed mucormycosis. We didn't see a single patient in this 61 patient we saw last year. We didn't see a single patient. However, this year, from the last three months, uh, our numbers have not jumped dramatically. We have seen something like, uh, we've seen in the last two months, we've seen 19 patients. Here we've seen... Anand, Anand. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Your slides are not moving. If you don't mind, can you make sure the I'm slides... Not moved it. I'm not moved it. Ah, okay. Okay. So in the last uh, two, uh, two months, we've had uh, approximately 20 patients, uh, 19 patients actually, of which uh, just three of them are post-COVID. So... The numbers that uh, have been treated for COVID and then developed after treatment, but the other percentage of those who were incidentally found to be COVID positive and has just remained the same. So uh, I'll just show you a little bit on, uh, I think the perception uh, are how we treat uh, COVID here, COVID and patients with mucormycosis. So any patient uh, who came to us with uh, uh, any an immunocompromised patient with signs and symptoms of sinusitis, um, when we suspect mucormycosis, we just had a discussion on that. That is black crust in the nasal cavity, visual or orbital or ophthalmoplegia, heart palate ulceration, oroantral fistulae, facial changes, periorbital edema, or signs of intracranial extension, including cavernous sinus involvement. If we were to see an immunocompromised patient with any of these symptoms, you would actually think of uh, mucormycosis and start uh, treatment quite uh, empirically. Now, what were we doing? So, a, a patient with uh, a suspected uh, mucormycosis came. These were the uh, investigations that we would order. This is in the emergency room. Uh, we'd get a random blood sugar, urine ketone bodies, arterial blood gas, electrolytes, and a complete hemogram, and a microbiological test. One was to diagnose uh, mucormycosis and then uh, nasopharyngeal and a throat swab for the RT-PCR for the COVID. And also we simultaneously get a contrast enhanced CT that was obviously depending on uh, how their blood sugar was doing. Um, when, we looked at, uh, when we looked at scrapings and then culture, uh, a large number of these patients had uh, uh, from, the, well, from the family mucrates. But we did get around 6% of these patients did have, uh, that's 5.8%, you can see this, had aspergillus. Now, aspergillus uh, will also present similar to invasive aspergillosis, is similar to mucormycosis. But the uh, advantage of having uh, aspergillus or uh, what, uh, from a treatment perspective is, uh, you can actually treat them. You don't really need to give amphotericin. They do well with even itraconazole. So you debride and itraconazole is an option when you, you are dealing with aspergillus. It's only with uh, mucrase where you have to give uh, amphotericin. Now, uh, so then we would uh, admit patients. Now, uh, in uh, JIPMA, uh, most of the patients that uh, we see were admitted under ENT. So we were uh, treating uh, not just mucormycosis, we were also treating their diabetes. 
and uh, the renal failure, all that was actually treated, meaning they were under us when we would get specialist helpers treat them, but primarily admitted under ENT. So we would never think two times of admitting someone in ENT with, uh, who, uh, who did not have ketone bodies were negative, creatinine less than 2.5 or uh, no intracranial complications. These were easy to admit. We had no uh, second thoughts. Uh, internal medicine would admit uh, patients with uncontrolled sugar. They would stabilize it for two, 48 hours with somebody with ketone bodies or with somebody with a neurological uh, extension. They have neurological signs. Internal medicine would admit. And once they think it's stable enough to send to us, we would actually take over. And uh, uh, RT-PCR, we would actually admit patients uh, based on uh, their COVID status. They would admit into the COVID ward if they're COVID positive. Uh, there were some kind, of, a lot of patients came with uh, CT suggesting uh, 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 COVID, but the RT-PCR would be negative. They would ad get admitted in a, a suspect ward, so we, because we still would worry about cross-infection. Um, CT of the uh, paranasal sinuses, uh, vast majority had uh, maxillary sinus involvement, uh, anterior ethmoids. Orbital excentration was seen in approximately 50% of our patients. Now, we definitely need uh, consultations with our uh, colleagues. Internal medicine helped us. Uh, in those cases, we had uh, difficulty in controlling sugar or electrolyte imbalances. Uh, most patients with, uh, unless they are, say, more than 500, which is quite common here in India, uh, we would uh, actually admit in ANT. And uh, we believe that uh, somebody who had, um, say, more than 250, all, all would start with uh, an infusion of uh, insulin. Uh, nephrology would help, for, especially for levels above creatinine, about 2.5. Um, we've had uh, patients with COVID uh, on dialysis. We've actually given uh, amphotericin while they were on dialysis. And uh, our colleagues in anesthesia are very important because finally, when you need to debride them, they, they really will help tell us whether we can operate on patients or not. And ophthalmology, of course, helps us with uh, documentation of uh, and progression of disease. Now, uh, what we've actually uh, found uh, is that we treated patients with liposomal amphotericin. Now, liposomal amphotericin uh, uh, in, in, in India is, is a very uh, difficult, expensive proposition. Uh, even in our hospital, which is federally um, governed and we have no un almost unlimited resources, uh, amphotericin B is a luxury. So most hospitals in India will actually be using, uh, uh, am I still sharing my screen? Uh, I think somebody else is sharing this. No, no, just a second, uh, Arun, there is some problem. Yes, you can share now, but there's somebody uh, there uh, who's... You will have to disable the annotation from others, yeah. Okay, so li uh, liposomal amphotericin B. Now, um, like I was telling you, uh, uh, till probably a few years ago, all our patients were receiving conventional amphotericin. Uh, uh, liposomal uh, uh, amphotericin is always a luxury. Um, over the last year, we've had uh, some help. Uh, many patients would uh, uh, would actually uh, make an in-pocket uh, this thing and buy lam liposomal amphotericin. In India, it's a difficult proposition. It, um, it costs around 100,000 rupees. Uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, what uh, an average uh, family would earn in a probably three months or six months is what they would earn. Uh, that, that's the kind of patients that we see because we actually see very poor people. So liposomal amphotericin, uh, um, uh, we find that uh, in India, most of these our patients really cannot tolerate more than two, two grams of a cumulative dose of amphotericin. So, our aim was actually to reach, give uh, two grams of liposomal amphotericin uh, if the paracinasal sinus was involved, two and a half grams if there was cavernous sinus involvement, and three grams if they had uh, intracranial extension. Now, uh, to you guys in the, in the US, uh, uh, that sounds ridiculous. You, you're probably giving three times what uh, we are giving. But when people pay that kind of money, it is impossible for people to afford more than this. Uh, it's simply the truth. And uh, the hospital also is unable to 
you know, devote more resources beyond this. But uh, surprisingly, our, uh, we don't uh, find uh, too much of a problem with giving liposomal aphodels. Now, the advantage of giving liposomal aphodels is we generally give uh, an average Indian weighs around uh, 50 to 60 kg. So we're giving 50 milligram per kg uh, uh, per day. Now, that is approximately 300 milligrams. Uh, we're giving uh, 5 milligram per, per kg. So we're giving approximately 300 milligrams per day in uh, a 5% dextrose IV infusion. Uh, we always give, we prehydrate the patient with normal saline, a pint, then give uh, uh, aphotericin, and then post-hydrate, we give one more pint. And uh, many patients develop some kind of uh, fever or rash, so we have, uh, fever and chills. And so we always give an antihistamine. Uh, patients get antihistamine and paracetamol. Uh, uh, as an IV infusion prior to us uh, giving the infusion of aphotericin. Uh, so if we are able to give 300 milligram a day, we actually we are able to give uh, the entire dose of 200 milligram in simply seven days. So our goal is to rapidly bring sugar under control, see electrolytes okay, operate anytime when the patient is stable, we operate 24 hours a day. The moment the patient is stable, we are able to operate. Within seven days, we are able, within seven days, we will give 200 milligrams, 2000 milligrams of liposomal amphotericin. And uh, we are able to send patients home within seven to 10 days. This is what uh, we were doing for the 61 patients we had. Uh, the problems that we had is uh, obviously uh, not all our patients uh, uh, will, will actually survive. Now, if you looked at mortality of the 61 patients, our overall mortality was 25.4%. Now, uh, but the interesting things about mortality, one was uh, the mortality in patients with COVID, those that had COVID and those did not have COVID was approximately the same. So somebody who had uh, mucomycosis and we incidentally found he had uh, COVID infection, we did not find his mortality was any higher. That was the first thing we found. Second thing we found was that uh, uh, literature tells us that uh, you need to operate on uh, somebody on an urgent basis. Uh, last year, we made a conscious decision uh, that uh, those who are uh, COVID positive, we would uh, actually withhold surgery because of the anesthetic risk. Uh, and uh, if you were to operate on somebody who is actually infected with COVID, their lungs are bad, uh, they are in kind of in some sort of sepsis. You have to operate, give them general anesthesia. Uh, these patients are unlikely to actually withstand surgery. So it is a very. Uh, we actually we were able to wait for. We actually waited for seven to ten days uh, before we operated on somebody with uh, uh, mucomycosis. So unless they turned, uh, we, we wouldn't wait for them to be negative. RT-PCR to be negative, but we actually waited for seven to 10 days before we operated. But we find that the mortality is same whether you operate early enough or you operate say seven to 10 days later. Uh, the only thing was all patients received uh, liposomal amphotericin. So uh, unlike what literature says, uh, we kind of differ with that uh, opinion that all patients need to be admitted, operate the next day or within six hours. We don't think that is true. Now the only thing that uh, we found was uh, of some of uh, the something that is of significance is patients with cavernous sinus thrombosis. Now patients with cavernous sinus thrombosis, the odds of mortality, the chance that you will die, is three in compared to those patients with uh, throm mucomycosis without uh, 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 without cavernous sinus thrombosis, you're three times more likely to die. But, and we also found that mortality was higher in patients with COVID with mucomycosis, mortality was 45%. And if you are COVID negative, mortality was uh, 33%. Now, we uh, looked at, uh, we have a hypothesis saying that uh, if you look at literature about cavernous sinus thrombosis, world over, we find that cavernous sinus thrombosis uh, has a higher mortality, especially uh, you're expecting a higher mortality. And uh, we believe that uh, if a patient comes with cavernous sinus thrombosis, generally he or she will not receive a thrombotic agent. We don't uh, give them heparin. 
but all patients with covid those under admission in, invariably were getting heparin so we believe that uh, the use of heparin probably had a beneficial effect in those that had covid and uh, mucomycosis so um, i saw some interesting photographs so we in india believe that uh, when it comes to photography and the sheer gore at what you can see we can beat anybody so we see the worst so i like to end with uh, something that uh, we saw uh, mucomycosis uh, it just ate away everything uh, we just had it was kind of uh, very very disheartening we had to remove uh, uh, her upper jaw the um, orbit um, most of the soft tissue of the face uh, she was with us uh, it took us almost uh, 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 six weeks before we she was fit to operate she was so very sick and we operated but uh, to reconstruct it took us almost six weeks till she was healthy now we did uh, uh, went and uh, operated with heroic 20 hour free flap to close that defect but unfortunately even after maybe i think it took us she survived with us for in the icu till she developed some you know sepsis from the icu and could not did not survive so uh, what i'm trying uh, we, about uh, patients about mortality what we realized is some patients are simply too sick for us to you know operate so we had uh, eight of eight patients who we could not simply operate they died before we could uh, provide uh, surgical treatment they had multiple comorbidities renal failure uh, stroke and things like that we were unable to operate but uh, somebody even uh, some people by the time you operate they like such extensive disease sometimes surgery uh, is uh, we, it's quite disheartening after you operate such a long surgery and then realize that uh, it's all come from not So thank you for a patient here. Hey, thank you, Dr. Alexander. That's a good leeway to start with uh, with this picture to ask uh, Krishna, Dr. Uh, Dr. Murthy, and Dr. Bhat to chip in and uh, share their side of the story on this uh, new car. Krishna, you have to unmute. And the uh, Krishna will speak first. Either way is okay. You have unmuted already, Dananjay. You can. Krishna, you are speaking. Dananjay, uh, Dr. Bhatt, it's your. I'll start, uh, huh? Okay. Yeah. Any day, neuro, neuro, neurosurgeons precede the ophthalmologist. So. You think? No, nothing. <laughs> nothing like that, man. Okay. Um, thanks, Anand. Very nice to be with all of you people. Um, slide down. One second. The screen sharing is paused. Vasu? No, you can do that now. Yeah. Illa, it is paused and the share. Illa, you are viewing Dananjay, but the screen is there. Uh, yeah, just go back. You stop sharing and then come back again. Okay, I'll do that. And I request some of the participants who are uh, notating uh, in between, uh, they'll be removed and uh, blocked. Uh, please, please do not do it. I think let uh, Krishna start. Something is. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I don't. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, Arun. Wonderful presentation of yours. I uh, enjoyed that. Thank you, Dr. Harika and Dr. Philip, for your inputs as well. I have a.
presentation or anything. Uh, mine will be purely observations, which we've had. First, uh, first of all, I have a, a disclaimer. I don't, I'm not an oculoplasty surgeon. I'm a retina surgeon. So my treatment of mucormycosis ends with the diagnosis and identifying the problem. After that, uh, the oculoplasty surgeons take over. From what I have seen of mucormycosis, which I've been seeing for the last uh, so many years, is I have, because I'm a retina guy, I see lots of diabetic retinopathy patients in my clinic. I have seen so many people with uncontrolled diabetes, but not many with mucormycosis. I see a lot of patients with HIV, with ocular manifestations, uh, people with uh, as much as CD4 of 1, 5, and uh, I have a mucormycosis is never a prominent opportunistic infection in our side. It's more with cytomegalovirus or anything like that. But where we do see my mucormycosis, whenever I have seen mucormycosis, invariably they are diabetic, no doubt, but very, very high diabetes with ketoacidosis. Invariably, there is a history of admission to a hospital to control diabetes, which is above 600 or so. Uh, in ketoacidosis, and 15 days later, they land up with, at your clinic with the uh, mucormycosis. Otherwise, it is people with renal failure. Renal failure in even moderate diabetes, they end up with mucormycosis. So these were 95% of our mucor cases were post-diabetic ketoacidosis or patients with diabetes and renal failure who ended up with that. So looking at this, Though all the factors which were discussed previously hold true as to why COVID is inducing more number of mucormycosis cases as we're seeing, taking nothing away from that, one other observation which I am seeing needs to be looked at is pure immunosuppression is not causing mucor as we see in AIDS. Just uncontrolled diabetes is not causing mucor as we see in so many of our uncontrolled diabetics that we see. But when either of these are associated with severe acidosis, metabolic acidosis, either in the form of metabolic acidosis or what I feel in COVID is happening is respiratory acidosis because you have a large part of your lung which is damaged. And this damage to the lung causes hypoxia. Because it is an end alveolar damage, not only is it causing hypoxia, it's also causing hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis. Our management so far of COVID has only focused on hypoxemia and making sure that somehow the, uh, this thing comes up 80% or so. But what we are missing out early is the acute control of diabetes, which is going to vary. We've seen COVID itself is throwing the sugars out of control in many cases. There are theories of how COVID itself is causing uh, non-known diabetics to turn diabetics, pre-diabetics to become moderately severe diabetics, and diabetics, of course, can become severe diabetics. But what's happening is because of the distant management which is happening with COVID, I don't think we are looking at the metabolic pattern of the disease. We're only focusing on keeping them alive and out of COVID. Uh, so I think we are missing a thing or two here. We are also seeing that high-end ICUs are not seeing so many mucormycosis. But there are some smaller ICUs where they have to manage because of the load which is there. They're doing great service, no doubt. But they may not have the protocols in place. Like I saw Dr. Arun's thing, like I don't know whether in the COVID management, do you have ABG as a part of your baseline value? Because if you're not looking at the acidotic pattern, what's happening, I don't think you will ever treat it also. And if you're not treating it, you're providing a very, very fertile environment. Muco grows very well in acidic media. Muco grows very well with hyperglycemic media. Muco grows very well with excess of iron hanging around there, which we've seen with COVID that there is a bit of iron all over the place. So in a sense, what's happening probably is that moderately severe diabetics ending up with muco is because of augmentation of whatever metabolic acidosis that might have happened during the hypoxic period uh, or respiratory acidosis which is happening during the hypoxic period. So you don't need to go into ketosis. There are all the things of immunity being down, 
the nasal trauma which could happen with uh, continuous uh, nasal cannulation with oxygen and other things mucosal breach and possibly the quality of the air or oxygen which might be administered the quality of the water through which humidifiers through which the air passes not taking away anything from it but looking forward as what you can possibly do i feel that our icu care needs to just incorporate these protocols as to look at what's happening from admission to the time they get out whether you are monitoring the metabolic process rather than just looking at the covid process i understand there are 600 700 patients of covid in there it may not be possible but there must be a way in which you are going to triage those who are likely to get into this kind of a problem because nothing else has changed apart from the fact that there is a surge of covid which has come and there's also a surge of mucor i don't think the character of the a uh, mucor organism has changed it's just that you are able to provide the same broth for it to grow from multiple sources now rather than what was previously purely diabetic ketoacidosis or a renal failure metabolic acidosis with hypoglycemia so now you have other features which are coming in also that could be one reason why we are seeing it there were a few other questions also which were mentioned here as to what are the early signs and uh, how do we detect it and so forth as to how we treat it uh, <clears throat> i am an ophthalmologist so by the time i see it it's actually reached its second stage so the ent are the guys who see it first because it starts from the nose and the sinuses and then subsequently spreads to the orbit and from there to the cranium so we are looking at the first source of entry is likely to be the domain of the ent so they pick it up very early there are hardly any external signs to pick up from so Arun will probably tell us that the earliest way of looking at it is uh, sinus, uh, looking at endoscopic examination of sinus, picking up those black eschar somewhere there, or a palatal eschar. So there was a dentist also who had asked, how can dentists play a role? Yes, you look into the mouth, and if you can find a black eschar anywhere there, or pain which is uh, you know not explained, then high degree of suspicion when you're looking at all this. By the time it comes to the orbit. the signs that we see usually are one uh, there is diplopia that means uh, the globe becomes frozen the movement gets restricted in the eye which is getting affected there may or may not be much of inflammation because this is a thrombotic infarct that you're going to see uh, you may not see a whole lot of inflammation setting up pain is a feature no doubt it could be very non specific though the congestion may not be very good because of the ischemia so you don't see many blood vessels which are engorged as we would see in any other uh, inflammation there will be there could be a sudden drop in vision which is largely because the organism entering and attacking the central retinal artery or the ophthalmic artery so if you have a combined retinal occlusion your vision drops suddenly and that's because your central retinal artery is gone ischemic so those are usually the signs and by the time it comes to the orbit uh, there is no more scope for a, a very moderate uh, or a conservative management uh, by then that means it's already reached the second stage a surgical intervention is uh, more or less required i understand arun picks it up much earlier so there may be scope for following up and looking at it and seeing but once we see it in the orbit the next state of entry is to the cranium so we need to stop it at least there so surgery is of high value in our case uh, before we go into the orbit and operate anything uh, those ct can help in diagnosis it's contrast enhanced uh, mri which would be the uh, this thing of choice investigation of choice largely because the contrast uptake helps you identify the invasion of the organism uh, how far it is invaded and how much to debride or there's no question of debride if it has gone in significantly enough you excentrate there is uh, no point in holding on to uh, small bits and pieces only if you have very good vision and you're not if there is adequate perfusion within the orbit then you may look at it as a two step uh, procedure where going only for sinus uh, debridement and observe the orbit and then go in but if there is significant orbit involvement if there is apical involvement to the orbit then uh, excentration uh, becomes the choice of treatment and largely governed by uh, the mri contrast enhanced mri which is going to guide us for the surgery not the vision not the other clinical signs or anything like that just see how far the 
uh, while uh, the uh, fungus has already gone in. So these, I think, were what I was thinking of, and I would uh, love to hear the views of other internists and other people uh, in, uh, who are also there in the panel as well as uh, watching, and refute my points. If this, these are observations which I have seen because I've been involved directly in either COVID management or in the surgical management of MUCA, but I've been aiding my colleagues, both uh, oculoplasty and ENT colleagues, to look at uh, how better we could reach a stage where we reduce the number of infections of MUCA. The classic mucors that we are seeing, uh, we have seen about 18 uh, mucors in the last uh, two months. 18, uh, these are all rhinocerebral or orbital cerebral uh, mucors, 18 of them. And out of which about five of them we've had to accentuate. Many of them we've been able to salvage with just uh, sinus debridement and uh, aphetors in B. What we see in the pattern is initially what we saw was up to about 10 to 30 days after discharge is when we're seeing the muca coming in. Are they coming in the symptoms of muca? Of course, now we are seeing them with earlier signs of muca because initially we used to see them with orbital involvement. Now we're seeing even before orbital involvement, thanks to the lot of uh, uh, awareness which has already been created and people are coming in and asking, do I have muca? Uh, but that 10 to 30 days is what we see, what we were seeing. That means it puts your insult as somewhere around 10 to 15 days before that. Generally, that's where the insult would have started. By the time the mucor shows up, it takes about a week, two weeks sometimes. So it's about the time when they were in the ICU. That's where the infection is being picked up or even sometimes home isolation. Because we can't explain how a home isolated person comes with mucor and even he's not even got oxygen. So he's been in home isolation. The only thing lacking here in the data is that we don't know exactly what his sugar levels were serially. So that is one thing. Was he in ketoacidotic condition at that time? We don't know that. Second is what was his hypoxic levels, whether he was monitoring himself adequately because happy hypoxia, he may be hypoxic, pretty hypoxic without knowing that he is severely hypoxic when he's in home isolation. So without these two major data, it's difficult to uh, you know, just say it could be so, but I think it's quite glaring those two factors we need to look at. People in the ICU can actually monitor these. If a rigid protocol is brought in, when you start looking and treating the metabolic condition rather than just the COVID per se, and see if you can reduce the incidence of buco. I think that would make sense. Uh, I leave it to Dhananjay, his observations on what he feels with us. And if there are any questions uh, pertaining to me, I will take it back as well. Thank you, Krishna. That's an excellent uh, points you made. Um, one of the things is hypoxia could lead to lact a lactate generation in addition to ketoacidosis. Uh, that may be a, something that you are indicating to. Lactic acidosis and uh, re reduction in the pH may be a good ground for mucus, uh, muca to grow in addition to hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis. Um, and uh, unfortunately, all our renal patients are prone for uh, most of this uh, Opportunity infections. Uh, Dananjay, yeah. floor is yours. Thanks, Anand. Mm. Are you seeing my screen? No, no. no it's okay. Somehow I'm not able to share my screen. Okay, I'll just try one second. Dananjay, actually, you can share. Yeah. yeah. It's coming, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, thanks, Anand and Vasu. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have just shifted over to another hospital. And uh, is it moving? I was initially at uh, Nimhans for almost uh, 20 years. And then the last two years, I have joined Aster RV Hospital. And I concur with uh, Krishna as well as Arun that though we are seeing a lot of uh, mucor mycosis cases, the number of cases with intracranial extension and where we have to intervene are far very less. Not only in our place, I, I discussed with even my colleagues also in Manipal, there is my uh, colleague neurosurgeon. He also, so last one year, he has not seen any referral from ENT that there is a mucor mycosis with intracranial invasion, which you have to do something. Uh, even in uh, Rangadurai also, they have some 20, 25 cases. They also have told that hardly anything is going uh, intracranially probably because uh, maybe uh, 
early diagnosis as krishna has told ent ent people are picking it up early and uh, people are also aware of this so here what what i'll tell you is we have done, we have uh, our ent guy has treated around eight cases of mucormycosis over here in the last 3 months and we have hardly seen one or two which have got intracranial uh, uh, invasion see what uh, this is just a brief uh, mechanism by which intracranial invasion occurs in i i'm sure all of you would be knowing all this but just to put it in perspective see normally what happens is if uh, infection is in the ethmoid sinus basically then the roof of the orbit which is very thin the roof of orbit as well as acf base is very thin and then there is invasion directly into the brain invasion occurs due to one or two reasons one thing is direct bone destruction and contiguous spread the other one is since it is angio invasive along with the blood vessels the arteries and veins it goes inside the cranium especially if it is uh, invading the ethmoid sinus it can enter into the cavernous sinus and in the cavernous sinus as you know the veins are there the nerves as well as internal carotid artery this is what makes it a very life threatening condition and also even if it enters into the orbit through the superior orbital fissure it can enter into the cavernous sinus and cause destruction now other than contiguous spread mucormycosis can also spread from the lungs as hematogenous spread another one is in iv drug abuses because of all the spores which are present in the adulterated drugs it can go into the brain and we also found that for brain mucormycosis the predisposing factors one is diabetes with ketoacidosis and immunocompromise plays a small role now once it what happens in the brain is uh, once it invades like if it goes into the cavernous sinus it blocks the ica it proliferates in the ica internal carotid artery vessels it thickens the uh, the vessel wall and then there is thrombosis and once it is blocked patient presents with stroke one hemispheric infarct can be present or there may be hemorrhages especially if the venous channels are blocked artery supplies the blood there is no outflow hemorrhages occur another way of presentation is direct parenchymal invasion and then it causes necrosis of the neurons and abscess formation takes place rare presentations of mucor especially mucor is very rare generally aspergillus and all the other things present these are small small embolic emboli are formed either from somewhere else in the body or in the cavernous sinus they get dislodged and they go distally settle weaken the vessel wall and aneurysm forms i'll just rush through a few cases which uh, we had uh, managed this was a middle aged person who was on covid 7th day he was in the general ward the covid ward and he was only on methylprednisolone he was not on oxygen he presented suddenly with right eye pain proptosis decreased vision and decreased sensation of the cheek this decreased sensation over the cheek is quite an uh, interesting finding the maxillary nerve which comes out from the infraorbital foramen can get damaged over there and this can cause sensory loss or if it goes into the cavernous sinus also there can be sensory loss and he had partial third and sixth the mri was done it showed in the region of the orbital apex there is some enhancement as well as in the cavernous sinus there is partial thrombosis of the cavernous sinus this patient uh, along with this uh, needless to say they are, they were all uh, ethmoid sinuses maxillary sinus all those things were involved with mucormycosis this was my, uh, and this is another axial section where the proptosis is very clearly seen there is a filling defect over here in the right cavernous sinus which is causes the proptosis then this patient underwent extensive ent debridation and now he is still status quo he is holding on he is conscious with paralysis of the cranial nerves for the cavernous sinus part of uh, thrombosis we cannot do anything it is just the antifungals which have to be taken and uh, it has to heal it now this is another case this is a post covid 20 days he was 45 year old diabetic he had received steroids for the covid he was not ventilated there was no oxygen supplementation given to him he presented with again severe headache pain on the right side of the face some proptosis eyelid swelling of few days duration when investigated again here you can see the ethmoid sinuses maxillary sinuses are involved and also what is interesting is there was an intracranial bleed you can see on the ct scan there is an intracranial bleed as well as sinus opacification ct scan is useful for us that the floor of the orbit and the acf base is clearly seen so we'll know whether there is any breach in this area again this is another coronal section which shows the bleed in the cranium and this person intracranially when we uh, reviewed all the scans we found that probably the fungus was not entering into the brain it was some bleed secondary to 
some small vessel block, ethmoidal artery block or venous obstruction, which has caused this bleed. So we decided not to touch the intracranial bleed because he was conscious, he was holding on with anti-edema measures, the hematoma could be controlled. And he underwent extensive uh, debridation of the nasal cavity and the ethmoidal sinuses. He is still in ward. He is waiting for amphotericin. Unable for this posture. With left upper limb, lower limb weakness, headache of two days. Only thing was he was HBSAG positive. We did a routine RT-PCR pre-op, which came as a positive. He was not on steroids. He was not on oxygen. He was not a diabetic, but he was a hypertensive, hypertensive for three years. On examination, his condition was not uh, good. He was uh, aphasic. He was just localizing to pain with left side, almost uh, one to two by five. That is very minimal movement of the uh, limbs. His MRI was done. Now, this is MRI is showing a lesion in the right temporal area. This lesion is peripherally enhancing central area of necrosis. The cavernous sinus area is involved. Again, here in sagittal section, you can see a large lesion. This is a coronal section which shows a lesion with cavernous sinus involvement. Luckily, his MRA, the internal carotid arteries and all the major vessels were free. They were not occluded. This is again on these other images like diffusion and flare images. You can see in the brainstem, there are some dots, white, white dots. So that indicates that there is already brainstem infarction. That is probably maybe related, fungus related, which is causing arthritis as well as occlusion. Here also he had extensive sphenoid, ethmoid, sinus, everything was involved. He underwent a craniotomy. And we decompress this temporal area uh, lesion, whatever we could decompress, we decompress to reduce the load. But however, the cavernous sinus, as I told you, we cannot uh, touch that area and it was left behind. But this, uh, uh, unfortunately, disease progress, he has developed uh, infarcts in the pons and now he is like decerebrating in a poor state. So we're not planning to do anything aggressive for him. This fourth case, this is not related to COVID. This is in two years back when I was in uh, Nimhans, we had uh, treated. A 55-year-old male, again, headache, fever, irrelevant of 20 days. He had kidney failure, and then he was diabetic with poorly controlled diabetes. He, had, he was confused, and uh, his MRI showed a bifrontal lesion, like an abscess. This was like an abscess with peripheral enhancement. Because of the sinus involvement and his, immunocom his uh, immunocompromised state, a diagnosis of pre -op, relatively only we made a diagnosis of fungal lesion. And since this was quite big and life-threatening, this was uh, operated. Again, here, these are just other representative pictures, sagittal images, which show the image. This is in the coronal section where you can see these two bunny-like uh, abscesses which are there and along with the involvement of all the sinuses below. He underwent a bifrontal craniotomy, and then we had to excise this uh, lesion, this uh, both the bilateral abscesses, and this came as a mucor mycosis. Post-surgery, he was fully conscious. He had improved in his uh, sensorium, and then uh, he was discharged. So we, are, we don't have an ENT over there, so we had to discharge him to an ENT and physician care for uh, managing these cases. Now, over the last uh, 40 years, we had at Nimhans, uh, we had... Uh, analyzed all the fungal lesions which we had uh, encountered. One was from 2001 to 2019, an 18 year study where I was also a part of it, and a previous one from 1982 to 2000. You can see it is very rare, 18 cases in, in the 90 cases we saw in 20 years, 40 cases, another again in 20 years. It's very, almost one or two cases or three cases per year is what we see. Here again, important one is what your highlight is, 52% was the mortality rate in these patients. Most of them were young and they had all the neurological symptoms of headache, cranial sinus, uh, cavernous sinus involvement and all those things. Diabetes was predominant in all these patients. These are all fungal, fungal invasive fungal lesions in the brain which we had encountered. And uh, in these 90 cases, what we saw, 41%, half of them were related to rhino orbitocerebral lesions. And all these patients, the 52% mortality, what I told, was combining both. These are all purely intracranial lesions, some lesions in temporal lobe, frontal lobe, and all. But when you consider only rhinocerebral, the mortality rate was very high in these patients. It was almost 85% mortality rate in these patients. 
these are some of the scans which uh, we had analyzed see this is this is a tempo this is infra temporal as well as medial temporal area involvement again cavernous sinus right temporal some isolated fungal lesions can occur in cerebellum or sometimes even in the frontal and parietal lesion this was like a, this was a, i forgot this was some uh, pigmentous uh, fungus some di di diatomaceous some fungus it was i don't know the name i forgot the surgery is what we did was initially generally for any of these fungal infections is first one is we will do a craniotomy a big craniotomy and we remove the a fungal lesion whatever we can remove as much as possible to debulk so that whatever remaining is there amphotericin can take care and suppose the brain is still full the pressure is very high the bone is discarded either we kept it in the abdomen or in the refrigerator and we replace it back later if he survives that is decompressive craniectomy decompressive craniectomy happens when ica is occluded the internal carotid artery gets occluded that time the entire hemisphere gets infarcted then nothing much can be done other than relieving intracranial pressure that time we'll have to just remove the bone flap and uh, wait for him to improve if he improves if single lesions are present we can excise the lesion either by craniotomy or deep seated lesions like in the basal ganglia we can do a stereotactic biopsy and if it is present in the cella predominantly in the cella and in the sphenoid sinus area endoscopic biopsy is uh, endonasal endoscopic biopsy is done these were the fungal histopathology features 43 were, were aspergilloma out of those 90 cases and mucor was five actually zygorm was at that time we had two separate zygomycosis and mucor now i think both are the same so if you com combine both it becomes around 18 all these five were associated with uh, sinus infection and all the five died these are some of the histopath pictures where you can see the broad hyphae which are present relatively aseptate with some branches here and there the mortality rate of the of our present series was 52% the older one which i showed were 40 cases were present that was also inclusive of everything that was around 63% that time you can see that renal failure multi organ failure all those things were common that i put the deaths so basically take home here is in relation to covid somehow intracranial mucormycosis has been somewhat relatively rarer it is not that common compared to the number of cases we are seeing in ent and uh, ophthal and early diagnosis and trying decompression with antifungal may provide good results but if the ica and cavernous sinus involved it is almost uh, 100% uh, mortality thank you thank you dr but yeah. uh, so krishna already um, alluded to some of the facts that um, hiv aids did not add this much mucor compared to what we are seeing with covid and steroid use has been common in india for many many years and decades um that is not new and with covid um there's been a explosion of uh, mucor i could like to hear your views and uh, arun's view um krishna alluded to some of these facts as acidosis al along with the dka diabetes and uh, some factors of elevated ferritins may be playing a part here so what do you think you have to unmute all three of you can keep it unmuted so that you can participate in the discussion there's a lot of interested questions um hope we can uh, answer few of them yeah uh, anand uh, see one thing is initially they were telling this uh, oxygen and oxygen humidifiers and all but in our cases we have seen patients even without oxygen have developed uh, mucormycosis so i'm not sure that might be contributing but that might not be the only cause and uh, most importantly as uh, in this one arun has told diabetes might be a very important uh, factor and people staying at home not controlling their diabetes may play a very important role uh -huh. and one more thing one more thing is i'm not sure how much it is it just came across that these masks which we were many of them were cloth masks it may be moist damp it may be not be cleaned properly so they keep using that and inhaling whether spores go in or not i'm not sure whether that plays also an important a role no uh, uh, like i told you we, we were actually finding a difference in uh, uh, how mucor is presented uh, last year versus this year uh, last year most or we never saw somebody who had covid and then developed uh, mucormycosis so we believe most of those cases were because of poor access to uh, primary health and uh, treatment for diabetes and uncontrolled diabetes 
this year we are seeing a few cases uh, here in uh, uh, in uh, jipma uh, but uh, i understand the large number of cases that we see in north india are patients who have been treated for muka and uh, have had uh, um, are, are treated for covid and then now developing the mycosis um, uh, uh, it's just a conjecture my take on this is first uh, what has changed from uh, last year and this year last year the recommendation for treatment of uh, covid was use of dexamethasone now in india over the last uh, few months there's a trial i think from the all india institute uh, which has advised the use of methylprednisone so uh, um, i have colleagues uh, across the country who have seen uh, uh, the use of methylprednisone has become extremely rampant people are using methylprednisone at uh, doses that are frankly uh, dangerous uh we have having people use a 125 mg twice a day for 6 days and so there are people who are uh, uh, young young patients not on uh, not known diabetics receive methylprednisolone for uh, say 7 days or 10 days with such high doses severely immunocompromised because of that and then develop uh, mucomycosis my other take on this is the uh, somebody was uh, has put this point in the chat box uh, is the uh, fact that uh, suddenly india is run out of oxygen now we believe that uh, 15% of all oxygen that is manufactured in india is manufactured for oxygen, for uh, medical gas while the remaining 85% is actually industrial gas so when oxygen is made for industrial purposes they don't really go through the kind of uh, sterility that uh, industrial gas go uh, that medical gas goes through so i think here in south india we still quite uh, uh, not that bad in having medical gas so i have a feeling that when you have air gas that is coming compressed air which is con- contaminated you're giving air over you know contaminated air that you're giving over a long period that to with such high volume 8 liters 10 liters uh i think that is possibly one of the reasons that you are having uh, mucomycosis in this year because uh, the even last year we were uh, giving people uh, humid water that we were using uh, saline we were using and uh, giving dexamethasone inhalation but we never had this problem of this magnitude so uh, the two things in my opinion that has changed from last year one is the use of methylprednisone second is the use of industrial oxygen which i believe are the two reasons why uh, we've seen such a big explosion of covid uh, uh, and uh, mycomycosis after people treated with covid Th- thank you so much arun krishna any any other points you want to add to this no i pretty much uh, say that look uh, right now we are still shooting in the dark we don't know exactly we don't have the finger on the button yet as to what exactly could be a single uh, reason why we are seeing this but i'm sure m- most of these factors do have a role to play uh, because they're all coming down to that one time when the patient had covid you know and anything and everything which is happening during that time of treatment for covid possibly is the only not which is linking it to the mucor which is coming in about 10 days to 30 days after your covid infection and treatment so that's the one strong link that we see everything which is happening during the treatment of covid is possibly responsible in some way or the other to start with but i think uh, uh, a sort of a info informed guesswork if you do what you could come to is if you look at the pathogenesis of mucor and then you look at uh, how mucor actually builds up in a body and you look at what's happening during covid and the treatment that we are doing to covid both together if you take i think you can form down to about five or six factors which most of them have already been elucidated it's not very difficult if we start looking at each of these factors independently uh, as you're treating covid from day one uh, you know it doesn't uh, it's not rocket science you just have to start improving your protocols your uh, admission protocols your treatment protocols to start with baseline sugars to follow up on sugar monitoring as you go along for my isolation patients who are prescribed steroids you know what the sugars are you don't know whether they have taking their medications at all or not properly you don't know whether they have to change their dosage of medications or not that's the reason why we are seeing home isolation patients who have not received oxygen then they showed a few cases and we see many of those as well 
they've not got oxygen, they have been at home isolation, they have not had very severe COVID, but they end up with mu carbon, you know, which is very, very unlikely. You know, in normal practice, we never saw this. You saw it only when they were metabolically stressed and their hyperglycemia was shooting up. So those were the two major things. Hyperglycemia still could be shooting up. Metabolically, they could still be stressed. So we don't know because you're not looking at those parameters. Yet. I think back of the envelope, just start looking at these parameters in the ICUs. I think we'll have better clear pictures. People who are treating COVID probably will uh, be able to judge as to what are those factors which are influencing the development, including the oxygen, the industrial oxygen, all of them could play a role. Absolutely no doubt about that. But that doesn't answer the entire spectrum still. There's no one factor which is answering all the spectrum of cases that you see. Uh, so my take is that we need to still work closer with the intensivist and uh, the people who are COVID and see if you can tweak protocols during treatment. And if you want to start steroids, you do these parameters first. If you want to do this, you make sure that you keep these levels at this level. Only then continue to treat. And you may see that the number of co mucor cases that comes out is, because I'm very surprised with what Arun showed. I was expecting Arun would have seen a large number more than what uh, we would have seen going by the number of COVID yeah. cases that they handled. But you look at where, uh, if the COVID case is managed in a less uh, resourceful place, not to blame anything, but it's just that it's admitted wherever they get a chance to go. And people are trying to do the best that they can to the patients who are admitted under them. But what if we can have proper protocols which can be disseminated down to the last person to make sure that even wherever you're treating, make sure you don't miss out on these factors, which could lead to morbidity later. So I think that's uh, that's the only thing which could come out of it is look at how you can monitor your patients better so that you don't end up with uh, long-term morbidity later. Yeah. One more interesting point Arun mentioned is uh, use of uh, methylprednisolone compared to dexamethasone. That is interesting because uh, dexa is a glucocorticoid purely and prednisolone as mineralocorticoid and a glucocorticoid. So it's interesting to note that uh, it's not just the glucose. So there's been a lot of concern about uh, contamination of the industrial oxygen. Can you guys throw in, there's been a lot of anxiety and a lot of WhatsApp uh, university messages going on. Uh, uh, I would, uh, my thing is only conjecture. I'm not uh, sure, I, I really don't have data. Uh, unless some of our, somebody actually works on you know, checking large amounts of um, uh, what is available and look for contamination. So um, I guess uh, uh, most of us are so swamped with uh, uh, treating uh, COVID that uh, really we don't have time to look at that. But I think that's a policy, as possibly a thing that we really need to uh, uh, look at. But because um, uh, we here in, uh, in my hospital, uh, we are lucky that we are near to oxygen treating plants. So we just uh, 20 kilometers away, we have somebody who brings medical gas. So we don't have a shortage. So we really haven't, and we have always been using dexamethasone. So till date, uh, we, have, you know, we have not seen somebody who we've treated develop COVID after treatment with us over the last uh, one and a half years. Uh, but we've seen people treated elsewhere, methylprednisolone, higher doses, those treated elsewhere coming with COVID. But uh, just, uh, I must also say that uh, uh, what we saw is last year uh, uh, in uh, Pondicherry, uh, uh, till to date, I think we have seen uh, something like 70,000 patients. Uh, I think that is a number. Uh, we have less than uh, 60 patients who developed mucormycosis. Uh, of which probably just 20 are from uh, Pondicherry, less than that. So this, uh, uh, to imagine that everybody who develops COVID will develop mucormycosis is a big, uh, is a, I think, uh, far-fetched. Mucor is definitely rare, it's, uh, maybe five times, six times more common than it was. But uh, we have a lot of patients who are right now in panic. Anytime they have a mild uh, cold, they're all coming to an EAT to rule out mucormycosis. So I would also advise that uh, you really don't need to worry unless, uh, you know, a mild cold does not mean mucormycosis. So, um, and uh, uh, when uh, it, it's really, you know, a difficult situation to uh, do endoscopy in this present uh, this thing for everybody. So uh, unless patients develop some symptoms are suggesting mucormycosis, uh, 
we really don't find uh, uh, no, there's really no way to find out mucormycosis when they just start. It's simply not possible. So, thank you, Arun. So one more thing is uh, just a thought. Um, with severe shortage of beds, do you think uh, the hygienic practices in a smaller hospital is contributing the way the turnover of beds, turnover of uh, uh, medical apparatus within a short duration of time due to the severe shortage of patient beds? Uh, possibly, but uh, that's just conjecture, I guess. Yeah. I don't think, Anand. Uh, 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 as far as uh, surgical debridement, like I, somebody was asking about surgical debridement in the chat. So what we find is surgical debridement is definitely important. But uh, literature says that uh, because it's dead tissue, you need to debride as early as possible. Uh, in a normal circumstance, we would uh, debride somebody as early as possible, definitely. But uh, patients with bad lungs, you try uh, giving them general anesthesia. There's an added risk of uh, just general anesthesia. There's a, a, a paper from Lancet which uh, talks about, I think, 25% uh, um, mortality, if you period operative mortality, if you operate on somebody with uh, COVID, if you give general anesthesia. And these are not uh, uh, minor procedures, the major procedures, you're taking out somebody's jaw, you're taking out uh, sinuses, easily an hour and a half, two hours, maybe even longer. And uh, you're putting your, uh, the risks to that patient is substantially high. I must also say, uh, uh, sometimes uh, we are willing, we as uh, doctors uh, are willing to take risks, uh, even to ourselves, provided uh, there's a benefit to the patient. But when that uh, risks to the patient is uh, disproportionately high, and then you think there's also a chance that you will infect your, yourself and your colleagues, you really think that you probably better to withhold for a few days. Believe that uh, your viral count in the nasal pharynx, the amount of virus that is there in the nasal pharynx and nasal cavity gradually comes down. Seven to 10 days you have reduced. They say by 10 days, most people are non infected. So uh, last year, we actually found that by operating on patients, even after 10 days, provided they were on antifungals, we did not find that the mortality among patients with COVID was higher. It was the same whether you operated them urgently or you could give, but antifungals were important. But this year, the challenge has been getting antifungals. Uh, it, it is a serious challenge. So uh, I am uh, this year, uh, I'm, not, I'm sure it's not just in my hospital. I think it's around the India. Uh, we're going to, uh, we're looking at, uh, um, uh, they're saying it probably be a month and a half before there will be adequate supplies of amphotericin. So uh, liposomal amphotericin. So we are actually looking at patients staying in the hospital longer, not getting better. So it is, and with larger numbers than last year. So actually we're looking at a, just the beginning of an epidemic of mucormycosis. Thank you, Arun. So there's a lot of questions, but we'll try to, because of the time constraints, we'll try to wrap up soon. Just a quick, um, do, you, do you have any take on steam inhalation? There's a lot of home patients with COVID who've been doing the steam inhalation. Um, do you recommend that? Do you not recommend that? What do you take on that? See, traditionally we give, uh, you advise steam inhalation and finally uh, you've actually boiled water and bought it in. No. So uh, uh, you cannot get, um, uh, somebody is using steam inhalation. I'm not uh, sure that uh, we, there is enough data to suggest that steam inhalation is the cause for increased mucormycosis. So steam inhalation has always been uh, something that we, we advise all patients. So I don't think there is uh, enough literature to suggest that uh, steam inhalation will uh, worsen this thing. There's uh, some talk on methyl, uh, what, methylene blue. Methylene blue is known to have anti-fungal properties. But again, unless we have, uh, you know, to the, I, this pandemic has shown us one important thing that everybody has a wonder drug to treat everything. And then we find that uh, uh, what was known already was what we just need to practice. So methyl, methylene blue, I'm not down, looking down at it unless we have, uh, you know, a good uh, trial that says that putting methylene blue in a humidifier, in a nebulizer is going to benefit. Uh, we really don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I, I know of uh, studies where people are trying to 
you do surgery and then wash the paranasal sinus with uh, amphotericin in saline whether that will help but uh, today if you when there is no amphotericin if you have to pour amphotericin in water and pour it into somebody's nose uh, you i don't think people will look at it kindly thank you there anand there is one other question which is asked whether masks and other things could be contributing to it uh, long term use of masks and other things generally see there almost the entire population is wearing a mask right now all of us are wearing masks every single individual is wearing masks most of them cloth masks and most of them are not washing it properly most of them are dirty and many of them are using it for many days on us but we are not seeing it in the general population we are seeing it respect to covid that the mucor is increasing so i don't think there should be any fear about use of mask at all uh, don't worry it's not coming through the mask there is a clear uh, association between what's happening in covid with mucor which is coming in with of all the other population which is using a mask none of them are getting covid just out of uh, getting uh, mucor out of turn so i don't think we need to worry much about that at all uh, people definitely should wear masks uh, which of us they have that that's an excellent point krishna at least uh, the uh, take home message is masks are not the reason steam inhalation is not the reason not to worry about all this uh, any um, so let's end up with a good note a few lines uh, for the patients by you from each one of you precautions and what to uh, what to do uh, uh, we are not sure of precautions but uh, what i suggest is uh, Uh, uh you have uh, persistent nasal obstruction uh, some sort of nasal discharge uh, fullness of the face uh, uh, some proptosis double vision all those are signs that you need to get treatment quickly uh, if you were to treat uh, uh, disease in the paranasal sinus alone and without extension in the orbit or into the brain uh, you can actually do well. patients really do well uh, second is uh, the only thing you can really prevent uh, is uh, is patients with diabetes mellitus is a control of sugar uh, i'm quite sure that uh, at least uh, most middle class families can afford a, uh, a glucometer at home but the kind of patient we see are different um, it's always going to be a public health challenge when uh, in a country like india where you see extreme poverty where people will not be will not have access to uh the treatment of diabetes so uh, possibly it depends on the kind of patient you are treating i think uh, yes. yeah just to end uh, i healthy lifestyle exercises and a lot of common sense we go a long way Krishna, from from my, from my point of view, uh, patients, uh, doctors who are treating patients with COVID, or patient uh, people who turn COVID positive, critical, involve sugar monitoring. Whether you are diabetic or non-diabetic, start getting baseline sugars done and observe for diabetes. They may creep in as you are on treatment or as the disease progresses. So pay attention to. metabolic parameters as much as we pay attention to the hypoxic parameters that we are looking at right now so protocols need to change if you want to monitor patients with covid especially distance monitoring telemedicine is so important with covid treatment but without valuable data sometimes you could be doing more harm than good so we need to devise protocols in such a way that your telemedical advice becomes fruitful to the patient not just to take him through covid but take him out of covid safely without any morbidity later so i think uh, as doctors we need to bring out protocols for ourselves because we are seeing a problem we need to address that problem as well so i think it is in the time of treatment that this has to be addressed not after you cross it thank you krishna uh, there is just one question which uh, i think we should address this is the somebody has asked the difference between liposomal and like lyophilic amphotericin Lip, uh, lipophilic amphotericin now um, liposomal amphotericin uh, uh, you can just put in 5% dextrose and give an infusion while the uh, lipophilic amphotericin is, is something that has to be put in a solution and then agitated with an agitator so if you look at literature liposomal amphotericin is so much more 
you know, uh, so much less uh, toxic. It crosses blood-brain barrier much more better. Uh, the only uh, difference between the two is that liposomal amphotericin is uh, more expensive. So uh, when you prescribe your, the two of them, sometimes, especially when there's a shortage, uh, those of us who are not used to, you just get amphotericin. Unless you look at this word liposomal or uh, li lipophilic, sometimes you make an error. So because basically the preparation when you, in, uh, you are giving an IV infusion, that how you do that is different. So if you can, uh, if you have the agitator, can agitate the solution so that it, it does not mix properly, uh, you very well may, may use it as uh, when you don't get lipo uh, somal amphotericin, but it's important that you look for it. One more point, uh, Anand, before uh, you just said, uh, my points uh, to be taken is that uh, I'm not suggesting treatment change because I saw some questions on uh, methylprednisolone and things like that. I'm in no way competent to comment on the treatment guidelines. All I'm saying is treatment guidelines need to be uh, sharper. That's all. But treatment, whatever treatment needs to be done to tide over COVID is best decided by the intensivist or the medical internist. So, thank you, Krishna. I think this is not, uh, we are not uh, commenting on the guidelines. We are just trying to have a panel discussion about some of the experts who are working at the ground level to get some input so that there are a lot of these physicians who are doing teleconsultations, including India and from abroad. They get a lot of uh, information from you guys, able to, uh, there's a lot of anxiety and paranoia, paranoia around these patients. Um, when they call up, they are very anxious to know uh, what are the things they need to know. Um, from what we can gather is masks are not a problem, steam inhalation is not a problem, get your vaccines, stay away from the crowd. Uh, stay safe. It's common, but it's not as common as uh, media projects. It's not like every COVID patient is getting mu mucar. From uh, Arun's experience at the Jipmer, which is a tertiary center, he showed a data for 61 patients, which is compared to the uh, magnitude of institute, that's not like exploding. When you look at the newspapers, it looks like everyone is having a mucar. So the public should get uh, some uh, some confidence after listening to this uh, panel discussions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions, but we are running over time. Uh, thank you all. Um, let's do once again in probably a week's time, some other topic. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, uh, Philip and uh, Arika and Arun. Thank you.